The SAG-AFTRA strikes continue after contract talks break down. Best Buy set to end sales for physical movies. Netflix setting up its first live sporting event. An Ultra HD Nintendo 64 console. And Microsoft finally acquiring Activision Blizzard. This and a whole lot more taking over the headlines of the past seven days. I'm Jason Grewa. This is The Fresh Wire. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Fresh Wire. It is episode 11. I am, as I said earlier, Jason Grewa. And yeah, a whole lot has happened in the past few days, as it seems like stuff always happens every week. I mean, understandable. But this week is a little different, as it as you'll soon see, a lot of smaller topics have taken over the news of the past week. Finally, you know, something crazy didn't happen that happened, seemed like every week. You know, Sony having their data exposed, a new PlayStation 5, uh, Nintendo online services shutting down, a lot of crazy stuff, a new Google smartphone. It's always a huge topic that takes up a lot of time. And finally, that's not the case. It's... A lot of smaller topics, which is uh, good. It's good. Um, but we are going to start with something I just want to get through first. Uh, Suzanne Somers, a uh, star of uh, Three's Company and Step by Step, did pass away uh, October 15th, Sunday. Uh, she survived an aggressive form of breast cancer for over 23 years. So she was 76. She was first in uh, some very large, actually some large films, American Graffiti, and then entered some shows, Three's Company. I didn't really grow up with this uh, actress. Uh, it seems like it's a few decades, but she had a very large uh, following and she was in a lot of different productions, step by step. And yeah, I, I just wanted to mention this. It's normally not something I would mention, but uh, she, a lot of people were very um, upset of her passing and it was breast cancer. So it's very upsetting. And I hope that her family uh, recovers and grieves uh, if needed. Um, rest in peace. So we're going to jump in, it seems like every week, I have to, I don't, of course I don't have to, but I, it is pretty clear that the union strikes, or union strike, Hollywood-wise, uh, marches forward. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, as the strike continues, contract negotiations between the Screen Actors Guild and the Alliance of Motion Picture and television producers have once again hit an impasse over resi uh, residuals and artificial intelligence two very critical topics that I can imagine is something that should definitely be negotiated over because those have the largest potential to screw over people in the short-term future. So the strike continues. It's been a few months now. And uh, the AMPTP talked about it a bit, saying it was, quote, nearly all, quote, unquote, of its demands regarding self-tapes and auditions, quote, the highest percentage increase in minimums in 35 years, unquote. And, uh, yeah, it, it was a, a lot a lot to take in. And uh, on x slash twitter.com, SAG-AFTRA accused the AMPTP of attempting to use bullying tactics, which were done before with the Writers Guild of America, uh, grossly mischaracterizing the union's proposals in an attempt to make it look unreasonable to the public. I do remember this happening Um Hollywood studios came together and said, oh, no, but we're being reasonable with these. Look, they're, they're not they're the ones not being reasonable. And it's a, yeah, it's a bullying tactic that I that I guess is happening again. But as we all know, with the uh, Writers Guild of America strike, it's over. They negotiated and the writers won. So uh, as the L.A. Times reports, sag has been pushing for a 2 percent slice of streaming revenue from the jump as one of its largest asks, big asks, along with protections for artificial intelligence uh, and while sag has made it clear they have no intentions of budging it seems as if the AMPTP might be hoping for unions resolve to waver now that it's 
sister organization, Writers Guild of America, is no longer picketing for itself. So they're probably trying to push that now that the WGA strike is over, the SAG-AFTRA, maybe they're more willing, but that's clearly not the case. So I'm rooting for the, uh, the people on strike. Hope they get what they want. Uh, and earlier today, an article in Variety actually says uh, that the SAG-AFTRA strike at this point now hangs on a gap of about $480 million a year. Uh, this article says that's the difference between what SAG-AFTRA wants in a new streaming residual formula, $500 million, and what the AMPTP, Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, is currently willing to pay $20 million. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge, 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 huge difference. Um, streaming residuals have been central to both of the strikes, whether it was the writer's one or the actress one. So the WGA won a bonus, and SAG-AFTRA is aiming much higher. The Guild has proposed that each streaming platform should pay $0.57 cents per subscriber per year, uh, or $500, mil- man- uh, sorry, $500 million annually across all platforms. Money would go to a jointly administered fund. AMPTP is offering essentially the same proposal approved by the WGA. Under that contract, writers on successful shows a 50% bonus on their fixed residual. Shows will qualify if their domestic views reach the equivalent of 20% of the subscriber base within 90 days. So uh, Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos said it would cost four to five times as much to apply that provision to the actors. SAG-AFTRA understands, has said and understands the studios offer would pay out about $20 million a year. So, um, yeah, it looks like the strike's going to continue for a while longer. And that's, uh, you know, that's not great for m- movies and TV shows in development because while the writers are back, so pre-production, at least at some point, can continue forward, obviously, who's going to be on camera? People that are in the union that are currently striking. So, you know, late-night TV shows have returned. It's... And, you know, they have actors and musicians on screen. I think part of the union strike is that they can't advertise anything. Anything they're working on that's related to the AMPTP. So no movies or TV shows unless they're select independent ones. Which I think independent films could have a huge boom uh, in the near future if this continues on much longer. And my opinion, because I have plenty of, is that it will. I think it will go longer. Um, I have no say in it, of course. But... I think if they're at a standstill for the past few days and the difference is between AMPTP wanting to give $20 million and SAG-AFTRA wanting $500 million, then, yeah, of course it's going to be difficult to get that between. So that's that's it with the unions for this week. Uh, I anticipate to continue talking about them every week. So Disney has been in the spotlight. They recently had their 100th anniversary of the company as a whole. They did a special Once Upon a Studio short, which is exciting. I unfortunately did not see it. I think it aired on ABC, and uh, I had priorities. I was watching Sunday Night Football. So I didn't get to see the short, uh, and I don't know when they're going to air it outside of their upcoming movie, Disney's Wish, which releases next month. I don't know if I'm going to see it yet. I would love to see the short, though. I heard it's actually pretty fun and enjoyable. So all of this being said, I found an article yesterday uh, that was published yesterday, and apparently there's going to be a live-action reboot for the famous show, uh, infamous animated show from the 90s, Gargoyles. I didn't see this coming. Uh, I liked the show. I didn't watch it when it was airing. I think it was, yeah, 1994 to 97. I was not born yet. Um, and if you don't know, gargoyles revolves around nocturnal creatures known as known as gargoyles that turn into stone during the day. They were awakened after being trapped in stone for a thousand years and are now and were battling in modern New York City. Pretty interesting stuff. Apparently it's going to be part of... Disney branded television for Disney Plus. So, yeah, it's going to be a Disney Plus show. And it's a live action reboot. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the Disney's live action reboot attempts have been either all right to really bad. 
So I don't know how I feel about this, and it's gonna be Disney Plus. So if you don't know, in 2020 and a little after that, Disney released a few films that were live action reboots of properties that weren't live action before, whether they were books or animated productions. Uh, infamously, I, one that sticks to my head is Artemis Fowl, uh, which was a very foul movie, and released to not critical acclaim, to critical disaster, and has since been taken off of Disney+, Plus, I think, and is now available to buy uh, manually for, like, a price of whatever it is. So this all comes together for... Oh, and, of course, a little small little thing, but uh, I can imagine it's controversial, so I won't get into it. Apparently the prosecutors, uh, so Alec Baldwin, there was a whole uh, involuntary manslaughter situation he was in because on the filming of Rust, movie he was going to be in, uh, back in 2021, a gun was shot uh, by his hands, allegedly, that ended in the uh, death of uh, someone very important. And I haven't gotten a whole lot into it, apparently, just earlier today, uh, prosecutors now say that he is set to face new involuntary manslaughter charges. So I guess if it gets any larger, I think it was like a New Mexico grand jury is said to like look over the case. So if it gets any, if I guess if there's any updates on that, I'll make sure to say it in the podcast. It's uh, it's entertainment based. Definitely not entertaining to see, but uh, definitely something I will keep my eye on. And of course, the last thing I wanted to say is uh, apparently... Um, just wanted to mention this a little bit because I don't normally talk about sports, but I have to say this. It is insane what happened with some of these football games that happened Sunday. Uh, if you're not too into sports, two of the best teams in the National Football League NFL, Philadelphia Eagles and the San Francisco 49ers, both had their first loss of the 2023 NFL season. A big deal, especially for a Miami Dolphins fan like me. Because now it's a five-way tie on who is the best of the best early on. We're about a third into the season now. And uh, two of the 5-1 teams, the good old Miami Dolphins and the Philadelphia Eagles, are playing against each other Sunday night. It's a primetime game. I am extremely excited to see that. I hope it's a good game, and I know it will be. Hang on to Attack of Aloha. Your greatness is still coming. Alrighty, so time for tech, time for tech. And uh, one of the biggest topics is, of course, Best Buy. Yeah, I was truthful. Best Buy in 2024 will stop selling Blu-rays and DVDs. Yeah, when I saw this, I actually, like, was completely caught off guard. Um, apparently, they are checking out <laughs> of the DVD, uh, DVD business. Good, good headline for an article. Uh, in early 2024, they're going to phase out sales of DVDs and Blu-rays. I'm going to assume also 4K Blu-rays and probably, eh, they don't say CDs. Um, but it, it's according to uh, industry sources familiar with the company's plans, but then Best Buy did confirm it that they are ending sales of DVDs. Now, as it is early next year that they're going to do this, uh, they will still be sold throughout the holiday shopping season online and stores this year, but that when they stop selling them, it'll also be stop, uh, they'll stop selling it online and in store. So, uh, lot, uh, not, not good news for people that w were really into physical media, uh, including me. I don't really buy many movies and whatnot, but I'm a huge fan of steelbooks for movies that I'm well, a huge fan of. Interstellar, uh, La La Land, 1917, uh, if there was one for Sydney White, I'd probably get that. And Casino Royale, if they ever did a, uh, brought that one back, I'd buy it ASAP, ASAP Rocky. But, you know, Netflix just recently stopped their DVD by mail service after 25 years. And now Best Buy is saying, well, we're next. <laughs> and they're going to stop as well. Uh, hopefully this is just a one-time thing and that it won't be uh, causing problems for the others like Walmart and Target. Apparently this article says that Walmart has been in talks with DVD distributor Studio Distribution Services, good name, which is a joint venture of Universal Pictures and Warner Bros. to assume management of portions of its physical media operations. Okay, so not great news actually um, because it shows 
Universal Pictures and Warner Brothers want to lay off some of their, um, I guess, capability, some of the importance of putting out these discs and putting it more into Walmart's hands. So it actually could be bad news for Target, too. Uh, and that's not good. Uh, I hope this doesn't affect Steelbooks. I don't see if where it, if it will. I think it will. Those are technically physical media. Even though they're collectible. I mean, come on. It's Steelbooks. But I have no idea. And that's very, very worrying. And let's just say if there's movies that I really wanted physical, I guess this is now or never, especially Steelbooks. Any Steelbooks on sale of movies that I at least thought was all right or pretty good, uh, they are now suddenly on my list. What's, what's not on my list is what Starlink is doing. Uh, I definitely don't need a service like Starlink, but I know that there are people out there that do, possibly the millions. So any update on Starlink is always going to be an interesting thing as they continue to, uh, SpaceX continue to send out their satellites for people that actually need this sort of service and, you know, wanting to make money. And a new Starlink page uh, popped up in the past few days to promote that in 2024, it's going to start offering cellular service. Next year, it'll be texting, and then 2025, it'll be voice and data. Uh, the website reads that direct cell works with existing LTE phones wherever you can see the sky. No changes to hardware, firmware, or special apps are required, pro providing seamless access to text, voice, and data. So, yeah, it's similar to what I think AT&T uh, is trying to push for. I cover this in a futurology topic a few weeks back that they were able to get with partnership of another company that's handling these satellites that a 5G call, I think, was achieved with a basic, a normal Samsung flagship phone that's not even from this year, I think. I think it was an S22, which is uh, last year's flagship phone for Samsung. And they were able to just have a 5G call using a satellite uh, satellite network, which is really cool and will allow for better connectivity in places where you really do need it. That's why Apple is pushing their thing of uh, the sa their satellite technology as well and that in the coming months, probably next year, they're going to really push it forward. T-Mobile has like this partnership with SpaceX. So I guess whatever happens with Starlink, maybe some capacity of it will be as part of T-Mobile. So I guess this may mean if you want to text over this, it looks like that's going to happen for T-Mobile users. So now on to something that I've wanted to talk about for a while that recently released and is very exciting. I'm not sure if I'm ready for it yet, but I got to mention it because it's it's legit. Aver Media, which I've bought, uh, they make capture cards and cameras, uh, webcam cameras. Uh, they finally launched its first HDMI 2.1 USB capture card. Now, if you're wondering what any of that hubbub means, I'll explain a little bit. So when you watch something on your television and something is plugged into it, more likely than not, if it's something from the past 15 or 15 or so years, it's plugged in with an HDMI port. And, you know, it has uh, encryption, content protection standards. It allows 1080p, 4K resolutions, some, sometimes even higher. And it's been building up with new revisions that require new hardware. HDMI 2.1 is the newest one that allows for high frame rates at 4K resolution or even 8K resolution. And the newest video game consoles, the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5, fully support them. They launched in 2020. And one thing about capture cards is when they support a standard, that is their limiting factor. So before this capture card, there were capture cards that allowed support for uh, pass-through of 4K 60 frames per second. Perfectly fine for older consoles, but not for these newer ones that can go even higher than that. And the, that's the pass-through. Recording is a, usually a lower frame rate or a lower resolution. And with these pass-through, that means if you wanted to have this capture card plugged in at all times and you wanted to have... 4K, 120 frames per second support because your TV or monitor supports it. You haven't been able to until now. And I own a capture card from Aver Media. I think it's the Live Camera Ultra. This is called the Live Camera Ultra 2.1 to really signal that it's HDMI 2.1 supported. So now this is, uh, I'll explain a little bit as much as I can. This newest capture card 
which is going to cost just a penny under $300, which for a premium capture card actually isn't that terrible. Avermedia supports, this newest one supports 4K, 144 hertz pass-through. So if what you're doing doesn't involve these, I mean, unless you're like, if you're a gamer, this is pretty important. But if you're not, this is a very gamer-esque uh, topic. And 4K 144 hertz is usually something you output from a gaming PC. That's what my monitor is capable of, but I don't do it through HDMI. I do it through another type of PC port called DisplayPort. Sorry if this is all too technical. So this new capture card, while it can pass through this now with a high dynamic range and variable refresh rate support, so two big pluses for uh, video games, you can capture at 4K 60 frames per second, which is extremely good and is actually ahead of its time. Uh, one of the biggest platforms that I'll talk about later, Twitch, where you can live stream your video games. I think, I don't know if it supports 4K 60 frames per second. I've seen at least one person do 1440p, which is the in-between of the typical 1080p and the the new hotness 4K. But uh yeah it's it's good it's good this is really cool really epic to see and for more professional pc gamers that play at even high resolutions uh sorry higher frame rates but lower resolutions 1080p 240 hertz is supported however not all of the hdmi 2.1 spec is supported they say that a firmware update is coming for october 19th that will enable 1440p at that same refresh rate but they're not confirming uh, 1080p, 360 hertz, except for the statement, quote, support for other additional resolutions will be added gradually, unquote. So this is like the first genuine option for HDMI 2.1. The only other big, big name in the video gaming capture card industry is Elgato. You might recognize that name. They're more of a mainstream option. They have plenty of options for capture cards as well. Uh, they have yet to announce anything uh, running HDMI 2.1. So Avermedia, this is not the first time. Their HDMI 2.0, 2.0 capture card, I think, was also ahead of Elgato. I, I don't know what Elgato had at the time, but their Live Gamer Ultra was one of the first to support 4K resolution in general, which was, of course, a big deal. And, yeah, I don't know if I'll buy this yet. I don't really have a need. I don't live stream video games anywhere near as much as I used to when this was very critical for me. So I don't know if I'm going to yet. Maybe if it's on sale for Black Friday, you never know. Uh, but it's looking like a compelling option. Uh, I would also have to look at reviews to see if it's buggy or not. Uh, Avery Media is already promising firmware updates, so at least they have long-term support. I remember the first time I got the Avery Media Live Gamer Ultra Capture Card. It was 2019. It had a really big problem with it that I was able to get replaced. It had weird problems with recording or pass-throughing anything except for my Nintendo Switch. And when I did my Nintendo Switch, uh, one thing about HDMI is it's called HDCP, which is a high definition, I think it's con copyright protection or content protection, one of those two. And pretty much these capture cards, that it means that you can't open a show on Hulu or Netflix and just start recording. Uh, but you, I think, can still do pass-through. You just can't record, which makes these, you know, a really cool addition for uh, professional video gamers or live streamers. Well, that wasn't the case with my capture card. I was having so many problems with it that I eventually just put in my Switch because I had a, a video game console that could support 4K. Nintendo Switch does not, so it's easier to run for lower-end capture cards. So I tried that, and it not only worked, but I opened Hulu, for fun, I think it was Hulu, and I opened an episode of some anime, Cowboy Bebop? I don't remember. But I opened an anime, and it just worked. <laughs> so that was a big problem. At first, they Aver, Avermedia, I think, was being a little coy on, you know, what can we do with it until I brought up, uh, I'm able to record an anime from Hulu over in the, oh, okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll replace it, we'll replace it. I don't know if it went like that, it was four years ago, but... Hey, I wanted to record the newest Pokemon, I live stream it. It was a pretty big deal. They did get it replaced. I think what happened is I actually had it returned to Amazon and then bought a new one that actually was a little cheaper. It was on sale. So worked out in the end. But that was very funny. 
uh, very funny, especially because they had they they looked at everything they could. They got to my computer and looked at all this data. They downloaded some thing to check over the firmware. That was crazy stuff. Luckily, I have expertise in that sort of thing, so I wasn't like freaking out when they took over my computer. Uh, and if you're wondering, they did delete the file after and erase its trace, so I couldn't keep it. Darn. So there's that. Little little tech craziness here and there. Uh, what's also going to be a little crazy uh, for Netflix is that they're amping up to introduce its first live sporting broadcast, a golf tournament between athletes from the streamers Full Swing and Formula One Drive to Survive show. Uh, the competition called the Netflix Cup will air live November 14th, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so that's that's cool. It's cool. The tournament will take place in a golf club in Las Vegas featuring Formula One drivers and PGA 12 Tour golfers. Uh, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Netflix was earlier interested in bidding for the racing series of broadcast rights. Netflix does not feature live sports yet, preferring docuseries like the F1 and golf shows as well as other showcases on NFL quarterbacks, World Cup, and the Tour de France. However, as... As it's starting to become obvious, because HBO, sorry, <laughs> not HBO anymore. Uh, as Max recently introduced a sports tier just a few days ago or so, right as uh, basketball is starting up, right as hockey is starting up, they're now kicking in with, you know, playing these sort of games now accessible on Max. So, and then a few months from now, I think February or so, it's going to become a paid tier for everyone right now it's free for i think everyone with a max subscription so I, I they know that in the coming weeks everyone's benefits for the subscription they have are going to disappear unless you pay more so now they're going hey come on you, you can stay a little more and now you get free sports for a few months until february and then we're gonna have to figure out something else i st I, I don't need it i have a tv service so i don't need whatever max has i have not used it yet uh, but it's, you know, it's good for the people that don't have, like, TV service, like Sling or something more traditional. And uh, it, it's curious. If Netflix starts jumping in with this, I will be excited for the people that end up wanting, you know, these sort of live sports for a cheaper price. You know, having to resort to paying full price for services like Fubo, for regional sports networks like Bally Sports is annoying. It still is. But... It is what it is. Sometimes you just got to say that. And if Netflix jumps in more so with more live sports, I mean, you have Apple TV Plus with the MLS season pass. Thank you, T-Mobile. You have Max with their sort of primetime sports coverage. I don't know if Hulu has something like that. I mean, Prime Video obviously has Thursday Night Football and I think others, actually. And, you know, Disney has all of ESPN, <laughs> ESPN Plus. Uh, and sometimes Disney Plus with Toy Story Fun Day Football. You never know. And YouTube has Sunday Night Football. Uh, Sunday uh, Night... Uh, Sunday Ticket. So, cool stuff. Let's see if Netflix jumps in as well. Beyond what they're doing next month. Microsoft has jumped in as well on a massive loophole that has finally been closed. If you try to redeem a Windows 7 key for Windows 11, it will no longer work, which means now you'll have to buy a legit Windows 11 key. I don't support piracy, but I definitely know that people out there do try to do that. So now, if you are on Windows 11 and you try to redeem that sort of key, whether it's Windows 7 or 8, it will no longer work. The error will pop up that it's unable to activate. It's not a valid digital license or product key. They originally, Microsoft originally announced the changes late last month, but as it was seen, keys were still activating, so it wasn't known when the block would actually come into force, but it has been confirmed. It has been, well, confirmed. It's now the case. If you try to redeem a Windows 7 or 8 key for Windows 11, it will no longer work. So I don't know if it, if you can maybe use a Windows 10 key. I mean, if you, you probably can and just upgrade to Windows 11 because it's still free if you're on Windows 10. And a little backstory, when Windows 10 did release, I think it was 2015, everyone that was on Windows 7 or 8.1, uh, not 8, because 8.1 was the free up, uh, update, 
If you're on 7 or 8.1, you're able to upgrade to Windows 10 for free for like a whole year. And then there were some loopholes here and there. And then it's been that case forever now. If you're on Windows 7 or 8, or it, up until recently, I think it might have been ended last year if you were on 7 or 8 and you want, tried to upgrade. But now if you are on, you know, if you're on Windows 11 and you try to use that key, well, now you got to pay up. But there's plenty of options to get a key for cheap. So it's not the end of the world. Uh, what's also not the end of the world now is, you know, seeing a bunch of these fake reviews for products like Amazon. Firefox now is trying out Firefox, uh, Mozilla Firefox, a uh, web browser competitor to Google Chrome. It's now testing out a built-in checker for fake reviews using technology from a company acquired earlier this year, FakeSpot. It's going. It's assigning a reliability rating to reviews, and from this uh, screenshot I see, it is a section of it's called Review Checker, and it actually goes a little further than just saying that these might not be reliable. It says adjusted rating, and it shows the rating, and right under it says unreliable reviews removed, and then it even shows highlights from recent reviews, such as the quality of the item you're looking at. It's called Review Checker by Amazon. Uh, sorry, by Amazon. It's it, You can use it for Amazon products, but it's Review Checker by Firefox. And it assigns the product's reviews a grade based on how reliable it believes them to be, offering an adjusted rated rating out of five stars with, yeah, I, as I mentioned. Um, apparently, the company, quote, uses a sophisticated AI and machine learning system to detect patterns and similarities between reviews in order to flag those that are most likely to be deceptive. So that's good. Uh, I mean, if you would rather not swap over to a web browser for this feature, although it is cool to have these sort of built-in features rather than needing extensions, uh, FakeSpot already offers its services via its website and extensions along with apps for iOS and Android. Uh, when FakeSpot was acquired by Mozilla, the uh, Mozilla said it would continue to work, quote, across all major web browsers and mobile devices, unquote. So that, you know... I mean, it makes sense. A lot of things that Mozilla is trying to push uh, has looked like it's been for the better of the inter internet. Good stuff. I'm a, uh, I am I hate unreliable or fake reviews. They do. I do definitely see them from time to time, and it just makes me have to rely more on the fact that Amazon has a fantastic return policy, and I just look at the price history. But every now and then I do see a rating for the reviews. I manually check from time to time if it is like a larger purchase that I anticipate to do. And speaking of larger purchases, Microsoft made a huge one, acquiring Activision Blizzard. And it was an over year long process and it has finally concluded. Uh, about last week, there was a UK regulator finally cleared through as the final obstacle for Microsoft to acquire Activision Blizzard King, uh, makers of Extraordinary games including Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, Diablo, Candy Crush Saga, Overwatch. All of these games now are owned by the makers of Xbox, makers of Halo, <laughs> makers of Forza Motorsport, the people that own Banjo-Kazooie. This company is huge now. It is genuinely huge, and the deal was huge, $68.7 billion. So a lot's going to change it happened the morning of the 13th, I think the night before, that's when the UK regulator finally cleared through and said, all right, have at it. Uh, and here, there's a very interesting graphic that shows all of the companies that Xbox now owns, and it is insane. They own the they own King, which makes Candy Crush Saga. They own Blizzard, which makes uh, fantastic games. Overwatch, World of Warcraft, Diablo, Hearthstone. They now own Activision which makes extremely big titles. Uh, Call of Duty being one. Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, uh, The Dragon, now owned by Microsoft. That's crazy. Crash Bandicoot, what used to be a beloved Sony mascot, now a Microsoft-owned character. I mean, it's kind of like what happened about 20 years ago. Uh, Rare, a very well-received company that was making really well-made Nintendo 64 and uh, SNES games for Nintendo, we're not owned by Nintendo, but they made characters such as Banjo-Kazooie, Conker, with Conker's Bad Fur Day. In the early 2000s, they were bought by Microsoft. The games that came out of it short-term were not that great, and some might even say long-term, and 
you know, outside of maybe Sea of Thieves, they haven't really made any huge hits since then, and it's now been about 20 years. Eh, at least they recently released uh, re-released GoldenEye, although it does not have multiplayer, only multiplayer on Xbox. Very weird omission, but I think it's on purpose. So, yeah, Xbox or Microsoft now owns an incredible amount of games, and they're the ones with Xbox Game Pass, so in the coming months, they have confirmed that the Xbox chief says, Games that are made by Activision Blizzard will not come to Xbox Game Pass until next year. He said there's no, quote, secret celebration drop that's coming in the next couple of weeks. So it's not like, oh, it, it, I think Bethesda, not too long after they were acquired uh, in 2021, or at least a few years ago, uh, not long after that, that's when they released a bunch of Bethesda games uh, onto Xbox Game Pass. Not all of them, but uh, a lot of big ones. So, and remember, Bethesda is the maker of Skyrim and the re recently released uh, Starfield, which has received very good reviews uh, and will continue to probably do so as it receives updates to fix uh, bugs and improve stability. So, this is a big deal. <laughs> um, and uh, also, the CEO of Activision Blizzard, Bobby Kotick, which was a big uh, tick, a big pain in the neck for a lot of people that were working at the company because of his controversial decisions and uh, how he was like the face of a lot of problems the company was facing, uh, sexual harassment and other really, really big problems. One big thing that fans were celebrating was that he was going to be removed, and he will eventually. Uh, it's been confirmed he will remain in place to help with the transition until the end of 2023. So uh, he will be staying on as CEO for now, reporting to Phil Spencer, the big the big boss of Xbox. And then, I guess, once we enter next year, Activision Blizzard will be like the others. It'll be a Microsoft-owned property. Now, cloud gaming rights, as far as I know, did transfer over to Ubisoft a few months ago. So Microsoft can't have a stronghold on the cloud gaming market, at least not yet. Ubisoft has a boatload of control over that at the time being. Uh, so... The FTC, if you were wondering, uh, they were trying to fight off this Microsoft acquiring deal. They initially sued to block it. Uh, the FTC failed to secure a preliminary injunction to block it. And uh, then the FTC has appealed the decision, and they will continue that appeal. Uh, but now that they've been acquired, <laughs> I don't think it's going to end well for the FTC. I don't know my take on this in terms of if it'll be better for video gamers, if it'll be better for people. I have no idea. I'm not a huge fan of companies swallowing other companies whole. You know, a few years ago, Disney was a huge deal when they acquired uh, Fox, 20, uh, 20th century Fox, <laughs> and all of its properties. That was a huge deal right there. And <laughs> it was... Now we have a massive Disney Plus uh, bundle uh, full of movies and content and uh, X-Men eventually coming to Marvel Studios films. And I, you know, it's, it's everything. It, it seems like it has its benefits, but it, if, of course it is at the end of the day anti-consumer because it's less competition. If a company can just swallow another company, then what's the point of innovating? Speaking of uh, video gaming that uh, I, in my opinion, may be a little anti-consumer or this actually is. Uh, Epic Games, the makers of Fortnite and Rocket League, acquiring Rocket League a few years ago. They made Fortnite. Uh, and they've also acquired the people that made Fall Guys. Well, they confirmed about a week ago that you will soon not be able to trade items with your friends in Rocket League starting December. The feature will be removed December 5th. Uh, here's the statement. Quote, We're making this change to align with Epic's overall approach to game cosmetics and item shop policies where items aren't tradable, transferable, or sellable. This opens up future plans for some Rocket League vehicles to come to other Epic games over time, supporting cross-game ownership, which is very intriguing because, you know, in Fortnite, you can't, you know, get a skin and then give it to someone else. You get the skin, and that's that. So now it might be if you get something in Rocket League, then maybe, you know, cross-game ownership with Fall Guys and Fortnite. Those are the two other big ones. So maybe if you get something in Rocket League, maybe you also have access to it in Fortnite because now they know it's etched into your account. So maybe Epic plans to sell cars in Fortnite. No idea. I don't really play Fortnite 
or Rocky League. I do Fall Guys from time to time, but that is a big ordeal right there. And again, as many other things, I anticipate some big news out of that in the coming months because this is a big change. Now you can't just give something to your friends or maybe uh, unofficially sell them. Now it's etched into your account. And I do, I played a little bit of Rocket League in the past, so I'm no, I don't even know what I have. Uh, I know one controversy a few years ago was when it went to Nintendo Switch and they had a Mario and Luigi cart. And because of Mario's stringent, extremely stringent policies on anything they make appearing on any other platforms, because remember, this is cross-platform. If you have the Mario Luigi cart on the Nintendo Switch version and you cross-play with someone, as far as I know, it shows up as a like basic or default cart. It's also why there was a speculation that Fortnite, uh, Epic Games wanted Samus uh, from Metroid in, but Nintendo would say, okay, sure, absolutely, but only on Nintendo Switch, which was obviously out of the question. Uh, I think some poster had uh, Samus in like a very back corner, but it was vague enough that you know it was probably legal. I didn't hear of any legal attention between the two. Uh, something that will not bring in legal attention, because I don't know how else to transition to this one. Uh, we're going back to Netflix for a little bit. Uh, Netflix, I think I said in an earlier episode that Netflix is trying out uh, game streaming to compete against uh, Sony and Microsoft with their consoles. Now, rather than having a game physically, because Best Buy, uh, well, today it's DVDs, Blu-rays, tomorrow it could be worse. Netflix is saying, all right, let's just get onto that early and start streaming games to U.S. TVs. Netflix is now letting some users in the U.S., United States, stream games on their TVs or computers. Netflix notes in a blog post that it's a limited beta test, so not too many people are able to access it. I'm not sure. I guess I could see, but I don't really care about this. I mean, they do have a game or two that I am interested in, but I don't really play mobile games, so there's that. Uh... This is similar to an original, an earlier test, and only two games are available to stream. Oxen Free from Netflix's own Night School Studio, and another game called Mole Hughes Mining Adventure. Okay, so not exactly uh, banger hits that are guaranteed to be uh, award-winning classics. But, you know, when is it ever for services that are just starting out? Uh, earlier... Actually, I remember, I think I, I might have covered this, but Netflix had a special controller app release for iPhones and Androids that they originally had no purpose for because it was it might have been released too early or maybe to prepare people. Well, now that's what you'll be using to play games on your TV. Netflix says the streamed games work on, quote, select devices, unquote, including Amazon Fire TV devices, the Chromecast with Google TV, so I guess both of the models they have, Roku devices, TVs, and more on the web you can play the games with a mouse and keyboard i wonder if you could use like a touchscreen if your laptop has a, or somehow a computer monitor has a touchscreen maybe you could just use that instead uh so that's cool uh, according to a report the company is planning to release games based on its own hit franchises like squid game wednesday extraction and black mirror games on those that are netflix exclusive will be that i think would be a selling point to get people in Apparently, it also had discussions with Take Two about licensing a game from the Grand Theft Auto series. Okay, if you can play Grand Theft Auto Five through Netflix streaming, that's just that's probably like the fortieth way you can play Grand Theft Auto Five. Now, if it's Grand Theft Auto Six, now we're talking. You know, now we're talking. But I would still prefer an offline way to play that game. Please don't make that streaming exclusive. That would be horrific beyond belief. What's all, what's not horrific? is what Twitch is doing to its mobile app. While you're watching sh while watching ads with a little bit of a live stream here and there, now there are stories to its mobile app because every mobile app has to have stories nowadays. Nowadays, whether it's YouTube Shorts, whether it's... Ugh, I don't even know. I mean, everything with TikTok, Instagram, WhatsApp, I think, Telegram. I mean, they have stories. Well, yeah, that's what this is. Um, but, like, it's... I don't know. All these apps nowadays have to have something that has like TikTok. They're, maybe they're worried. You know, they want some of that, some of that beautiful money coming in through their service, and the worry that the U.S. could one day ban TikTok because it's uh, technically owned by a Chinese company. Uh, but that's political. We'll get into that. But all the companies are, you know, adding something similar to TikTok, and it looks like this is gonna be something like it. Um, not to the extent, though, it looks like this could be more like maybe what Instagram does, where 
Qualified users can post pictures, text messages, or clips that will disappear after 48 hours. Um, and that viewers will be able to see stories uh, in a dedicated space. Stories are only available to affiliates and partners who have had one stream in the last 30 days. So, yeah. So it's more like what Instagram stories are rather than TikTok. But I think there is something like what TikTok is for Twitch, at least not yet, but it might be coming out if it hasn't already. I don't really use the Twitch mobile app because, just like I said, there's more ads than live stream. So <laughs> I, I don't really use that often. Hey, it's a way for me to get uh, less uh, brain rot watching videos and live streams all day. So interesting stuff. I say interesting stuff for a lot of things. And maybe this will help with audience engagement, which is which has been a huge problem for Twitch, where the only alternatives you got is, eh, try out YouTube. Ah, just kidding. Don't try it on YouTube. Or go on <laughs> Kick. Yeah, that, that, wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't end well. Um, all right, and last big thing I want to talk about before the Futurology. Apparently, there is a 4K Nintendo 64 coming. Of course, it's third party. And it's made by Analog company known for modern takes on retro hardware finally enters the 64-bit era it's called the analog 3d the company says the new console have quote 100 compatibility unquote with n64 cartridges and will even support 4k output it'll even have bluetooth support and four controller ports like the original 64 not a lot is known about it they did not even show off the full console just a little tease of it and the only thing we know is, not even price, is that it will be releasing sometime next year. Uh, apparently there's going to be a wireless, because this has Bluetooth, there will be a wireless 8-bit eight eight do controller. 8-bit do, which from this image I'm seeing is barely even a look at it either, although it looks kind of interesting. Uh, it looks like a normal, actually, <laughs> I think it's a normal controller. They're not showing, it's faded out, so you can't see like the left of it. I hope it's a normal looking controller. The N64 controller, very strange, uh, coming as someone that used it as a kid to play some high quality games. It's a very interesting controller, and I'm glad they went away from that with the fantastic Nintendo GameCube controller. But this looks like a more normal one. And 8 bit though, makes fantastic third party controllers, uh, mainly for Nintendo Switch, mobile, and PC. And I've owned a few, and they are fantastic controllers, and I highly recommend them uh, on a sale. They are great, genuinely great. So, and this is very interesting because the N64 is infamously known for being difficult to emulate. It took a very long time to get proper, accurate em emulation for the Nintendo 64, very long after its release. Um, and, you know, when N64 games started to become emulatable officially through the Nintendo Switch online service, there were a few bugs that popped up here and there for the N64 emulation on console. Like fog problems were arising where fog wouldn't show up. Some reflections were having problems, I think. Textures. I think a game crashed. One game, like, crashed at a point. The uh, company says that they've been working on the Analog 3D for the last three years. Founder Christopher Taber... Tabor, T-A-B-E-R, said, this is one that nobody thought was possible. And he's not wrong. I thought that if this was going to happen, it would be a long time from now, or if it was going to be a Nintendo Mini console, like what they did with the NES Mini or SNES Mini, and never thought, oh, N64 is next. And said nothing was next. Nothing. All right. So that's it for the tech and everything in between, but in video games. But now it's time for Futurology. And I've got another double-decker because one topic is cool, the other is, I think, very ambitious. A robotic technology company, FBR Limited, showed off its next generation Hadrian X construction robot. So this tablet-controlled machine has a 32-meter telescoping boom and can handle blocks up to a certain amount. It apparently can stack bricks like crazy. It was like one estimate said like over 300 per hour, which is sick. I'm just going to verify that. Yeah, 300 bricks an hour. Uh, apparently, it's starting work in the U.S. Uh, it started up in Australia, completed a few projects. And yeah, May 2023, it led a speed record of nearly 300 utilizing USA format cement masonry blocks. It exceeds the highest ever recorded peak from the robot's predecessor. So that's cool, you know. Uh, very, very 
difficult thing to build up construction with brick by brick. And if a robot can do that, that's something that now people can focus on other things rather than something as simple and to the point as just building blocks, literally. Another thing that I saw, a very cool article, is, and this is not a sponsor, I'm not trying to brag about anything or gloat about anything, but it is cool that uh, something that we take for granted, you know, Google Maps and Waze, Apple Maps, navigation, you know, how incredible it is that the navigation is as easy as it is. And an article says that Google has been analyzing data from its Google Maps app. I normally use Waze, but they're owned by the same company. Uh, and it's suggesting how cities can adjust traffic light timing to cut wait times and emissions. The company says it's already cutting stops for millions of drivers. That is incredible. AI algorithms initially led to timing tweaks at 70 intersections. Uh, timing out uh, its AI-powered recommendations for timing out the busy lights cut as many as 30% of stops and 10% of emissions for 30 million cars a month. That's incredible. Like, we take these apps for granted because, you know, they take a lot of uh, our personal data away from us, uh, using it for personalized recommendations and ads. And, you know, nothing in life is free. But sometimes you got to look at these sort of apps and, like, wow, it's, like, incredible that, you know, AI can really achieve a lot. Like, you look at these AI chatbots and they're as incredible as they are. DALI 3, which, has, which can produce some very, very well-made fake images sometimes too well um and yeah it's always it's always cool to see all this you know to like take it in it's like wow this is all happening in the background and it's actually improving the world cutting emissions uh, reducing wait times for drivers yeah it takes our personal data which is why i'm not a huge fan of it but sometimes you know publicly they i guess push things in a way that benefits people I guess they have to. They can't just take people's data and go, all right, that's it. Um, so there's that. And that'll be it for me. Uh, that's another episode for the books. A lot of stuff was covered, and I continue will to be covering things. You know what I didn't do? I didn't say the time or day. Right now it's 9.49 p.m. October 17th, 2023. I don't know when this was started. I'm a one-take Jake, but I did have a few pauses here and there. And, yes, I did record a little earlier, but either way, I do plan to continue doing this every Tuesday evening. I appreciate everyone that tunes in. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I do a research that takes a, quite a bit of time, and then I record it all in, and I process it, and it gets to you guys. Now, one thing I do want to say before I go, make sure to check out my brand new website, thefreshwire.com. That's where I'll be linking my podcast and a few articles of news topics that I find interesting here and there that I may end up covering. For example, some things that I end up not covering, like how the uh, singer Pink regrets making the SpongeBob song, We've Got Scurvy. I covered that in thefreshwire.com and not in the podcast, but... Yeah, like stuff like that. And of course, if you have any topics that you want to send over to me, make sure that you do so. I'm probably going to set up maybe a thing on the website so people can send in requests. But you can also send in a voice message through, I think, the description of each episode. There's a way to, to send a voice message. So if you want to do it there, that's perfectly A-OK fine with me. In the meantime, thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate it. And I will catch you all in the next one. Till then, take care of yourselves and have a good one. Peace.